Great. Welcome, everybody, to our webinar slash teach-in slash panel, Problematizing Police, an online teach-in with educators and labor organizers. We're joined by folks from UAW 2865, the union representing graduate student workers across the UC system, as well as someone from GEO Local 3550, the grad student worker union in Michigan that uh, went on a really impressive strike with an abolitionist demand. And also we have somebody from SEIU Drop the Cops, and we have folks from Cops Off Campus. We have a representative from United Teachers Los Angeles. Uh, they've been very involved in trying to get police out of K through 12 Los Angeles schools. And we also have uh, uh, two representatives from No Cops Unions, someone with National Women's Law Center United, and also somebody with SAG AFTRA. And so, Stephanie, I think you wanted to share something before we begin. Um, yes, welcome everyone. Thank you so much to all of you who are here today. Thank you especially to our panelists who took the time out of your busy schedules to come and have this conversation with us. Uh, those of you who are at home watching, either live or on record, here comes my young one in the in the camera. Uh, we'd like to just start by giving by giving thanks. Uh, so we here at UCR would like to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water and air, the Kowea, Tongva, Luceno, and Serrano peoples, and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, this meeting place is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, including UCR faculty, students, and staff. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. Thank you. It's with peace and love, uh, justice at the heart of what we're doing here today uh, that we proceed. And again, um, thank you so much to the panelists with, without whom we would not be able to have this discussion. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass the mic back over to James to get us started. And Kendra, would you be able to stop the screen share so we can, oh, there you go. <laughs> Granted my wish before I even got it out. I guess a good place to start would be with maybe the person to my right in our Brady Babanch kind of Zoom view here, which is Amanda Riggle, who's with UAW 2865, has also been involved in the Cops Off Campus campaign. And so Amanda, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about how your union came to um, agree upon that statement that was released uh, calling for the defunding of the University of California Police Department and ultimately the abolition of police on UC campuses. How did you all get support for that and how did you get people behind it? Yeah, thank you. Um, so that's an interesting question. I think as far as graduate student workers go, we have always been the target of UCPD um, historically. If you go back to the 60s um, and you think about the protests that went on in Berkeley specifically against the Vietnam War, you see a long history of the UCPD uniting with um, uh, area police and assaulting graduate students who are standing up and protesting um, on their campuses. Then that has historically been true and it's still the case when we look at the Wildcat Strikers in Santa Cruz, we see um, UCPD on Santa Cruz's campus yet again uniting um, with local police and assaulting both graduate and undergraduate students who are standing up for graduate student rights. Um, so there really wasn't a, a big, I think, debate. This is something that we are just doing. It's part of our anti-austerity uh, campaign as well because we see kind of like police and police funding as part of um, the fight against the public good, which we uh, do not stand for. Um, but yeah, I think it, it, it's been a demand since uh, before we even had uh, the COLA strikes, the cost of living adjustment strikes going on. And uh, at UCR specifically, the, our three demands were not just um, for a cost of living adjustment, um, but it was for the reinstatement of the Santa Cruz workers who were fired unfairly. And then our third demand was always the removal of the UCPD. Um, so this has been a longstanding goal of ours um, that kind of predates the recent uprisings, but uh, I think it coincides very well with them. Great, thank you. And so my vision for this initial round of questions is we'll go through pretty much everybody, um, kind of just trying to get a sense of the work that you've been involved in, whether it's working to defund police uh, or it is getting police out of your unions, whatever the case is, you can tell us a little bit about that. And then 
uh, we can hopefully have time for a second round of questions and then maybe Q&A at the end. And so I will continue just going in the order that I see people. <laughs> and so next up on my list is Alexis Simpson, who is a member of SAG AFTRA, a uh, Los Angeles local, and has been involved in no cop unions. And Alexis, I was just curious how others in SAG AFTRA responded to your involvement in no cop unions and how they received that campaign generally, how you got involved in it and where it's going. Uh, thank you for having me. And um, so the my my work with within SAG AFTRA started before my work with no cop unions. Uh, with within SAG AFTRA, essentially, so essentially the structure of it is that. Um, SAG-AFTRA is one of the 55 affiliate unions that are um, under the umbrella of the AFL-CIO. One of those 55 unions is the I, uh, IUPA, which is uh, a, a exclusively a police union. There are also a couple of unions like AFSCME that have police and uh, corrections officers uh, within their ranks, but they're not exclusively police. So, so prior, Prior to this year, I, I, I wasn't even aware that I was affiliated with a police union through my membership in the AFL-CIO as a sag after member. But uh, pr pretty much right after the, uh, the, the murder of George Floyd, you started seeing a lot of companies put out their statements on their social media about how Black Lives Matter. SAG AFTRA was no different, and they put out what was essentially a toothless statement uh, that was like, yeah, we believe Black Lives Matter. And we sure hope police will, uh, you know, reform themselves. And it was pretty uh, infuriating because at the same time, the WGA East, uh, which is the East Coast Writers Union, uh, they, they have a lot of, um, I think they're mainly journalists more than television and screenwriters, but they, they, the WGA East actually passed a disaffiliation resolution at the national level. And in, in my mind, we should be joining our fellow union in solidarity. And instead, SAG after leadership is trying to have it both ways. They're trying to make it seem like they're all in for racial justice, but also not piss off uh, or rock the boat at, at the AFL-CIO level. And so a colleague of mine and I, we started a petition and we got about a thousand signatures. And through some connections, we started uh, working with Color of Change and Build Power. Um, both grassroots organizing, uh, grassroots organizations to, to try to leverage one asset of SAG-AFTRA, which is celebrity, to, to get more attention to the issue. We're still sort of in the middle of that. Uh, so, so basically where we're at now is we're trying to uh, cultivate like some press attention with getting some higher profile SAG after members to sign on to a letter that threatens our president with a recall if they don't comply with our demands to pass a disaffiliation resolution. Uh, in the meantime, I, I stumbled across NCU like on social media and just uh, became involved. And it, NCU is really just a great collection of people working within their own unions. I think we have a lot of AFT folks a lot of grad students, um, um, some SEIU folks, I think there too. There's just a mishmash of people. Uh, and we're always looking for more people who wanna just come in and stay, you know, share ideas and, and solidarity about how to disaffiliate from police unions and, uh, you know, divest from policing in every way possible. Great, thank you for sharing that. We have uh, another representative from No Cop Unions, NCU. Uh, she's also involved in a member of National Women's Law Center United, and that's Elizabeth Tang has joined us. Um, Elizabeth, would you like to tell us a little bit about your work with uh, your union and how you got involved in the uh, No Cop Unions campaign? Sure, thanks so much. Um, I'm Elizabeth Tang, she, her. Um, I'm an education and civil rights attorney at National Women's Law Center in DC. Um, I got involved um, through um, our organizing committee. Um, we just got voluntarily recognized actually in April and I'm now serving as one of the co-chairs of our bargaining unit. Um, and we're affiliated with the nonprofit um, Professionals Employees Union, 
NPEU, which is part of up the chain, um, part of AFL-CIO. Um, and back in July, um, NPEU um, issued a statement calling for um, the AFL-CIO to disaffiliate from IUPA, similar to what Alexis just said, um, and also um, to defund police. And the conversation sort of started because we are more of a progressive union. And so about a week after the uprising started, the executive board actually organized a town hall and we all came together and, you know, talked about how we could do our part to, you know, join in solidarity. Um, and it was sort of a part teaching, part of an open forum so that members could like ask and answer each other's questions because not everybody was immediately on board with defunding, even if they, you know, support reform. Um, of course, you know, we sort of view the two things as diametrical to each other. You can't have defund and, and reform unless the reforms are the types of reforms um, that, that push us toward eventually dismantling the police. Um, and so there was a call for volunteers to draft statements. And actually the very next day we saw the WGA East's um, disaffiliation statement, which, you know, um, incentivized us even more to do our own statement. And we basically over about two weeks, we had a couple meetings and hashed out the statement. We gave the entire NPEU membership about um, a week to give feedback. And we made some light edits um, in response to that. And it was actually really heartening. We did see some people say, you know, I don't think we should say defund police or I, you know, I, I support disaffiliating, but I don't know about defunding. And then there were others who said, you know, I think you should say abolish police. Um, and we made sort of a tactical decision there that, you know, in order to get the most support from all of our membership um, and also in a way to not compromise our values. I think all of the co-authors do um, consider themselves abolitionists, um, but we wanted to also echo the calls of, um, the movement for Black Lives and the explicit demand there was to defund police. So we felt that that was a good way of not compromising our values. And so that is the language that we landed upon. Um, and then, you know, we published a final statement um, sometime in July. And then ac actually, um, NPEU has a semi-annual um, membership meeting for all of our members. Um, and so at one of those meetings, which happened also in July, we then presented the statement and explained it a little bit more fully to um, all of the members why, you know, we said each of these things and what was the significance of all the things that we said. Um, and I wanted to go over a few of those points in case um, any of these talking points are helpful to you as you're talking to your colleagues um, and helping them sort of come on board, you know, because I do think everyone is like in support of reform, but we have different ideas of ref what reform means and what does it mean to abolish the prison industrial complex. Um, so some of the things that we said in our statement that, you know, folks that they resonated with um, is, you know, the historical underpinnings and why there is this disconnect between labor unions and cop unions. Um, and I might be saying stuff many of you already know, so just <laughs> bear with me, but, um, you know, police began as slave patrols um, and they kidnapped both formerly enslaved Black people, but also Black folks who were born in free states who had never been enslaved. Um, and the reason that we wanted to highlight this point and start with it is because that means that police originated not only to uphold white supremacy, but also to uphold capitalism. And we included capitalism here because the extraction of free black labor um, was a massive labor rights violation. And we wanted to highlight this point that, you know, we as members of the labor union recognize that racial justice cannot be separate from workers' rights. Um, and then another thing in our statement, which I also dropped, you know, in the chat, um, we pointed out that police have a long history of suppressing unions, breaking strikes, and killing workers to protect property and to serve owners of capital. Um, and that, you know, we felt was very important because um, it, you know, there's this sort of misconception among folks that like police are workers and therefore they deserve their unions. Um, and our position really is that cops are not workers. Um, you cannot, you know, as an analogy, you can't be an arsonist, you can't burn people's homes down and call yourself a firefighter. Um, analogously, you can't suppress unions, break strikes, enslave workers, kill workers, um, and, you know, serve as like this foot soldier for capitalism and then also call yourself a worker. And so by definition, you know, cops are not workers. And we wanted to make that point very clearly to help folks understand why it was important for us to expel cop unions from labor unions. Um, and then in terms of the defund demand, obviously the AFL-CIO cannot defund police. But we wanted to include a call to defund police um, because that is part of the larger call um, among Black organizers and Black-led organizations. Um, and two of the things that we also shared in our meeting that I wanted to share with you all in case, again, it is helpful as you are um, bringing your colleagues on board. Um, reforms don't work, and we know this. 
um, George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis. Minneapolis had already required its cops to intervene when um, one of their colleagues uses excessive force. But like, you know, we all know eight minutes, 46 seconds. And during that entire time, three cops stood by and did not intervene. So that reform, you know, that was already in place, didn't work. Um, Breonna Taylor was killed in Louisville. Louisville already required their cops to issue warnings before shooting. We all know they burst in, she was already dead while she was sleeping. There was no warning issue before they shot her, before they even entered her home. Um, so again, that's an example of reforms not working. Um, people have also said, you know, if we don't have cops, what about murderers and rapists? I'm a Title IX attorney, I work specifically on sexual harassment. I don't see a disconnect there between gender justice, survivor justice, and racial justice and abolition of police and prisons. Um, to those people who say, you know, what about murderers and rapists? Um, I would say, you know, cops only solve 40% of murders. They only put less than 1% of rapists in prison. They're not actually good at doing their supposed job, which is supposedly to stop violence. But more importantly, they're causing such an incredible amount of violence. Um, one third of people killed by strangers in the US are killed by police, one third. Um, we all know the most common form of police misconduct is excessive force. The second most common form of police misconduct is sexual violence, sexual misconduct. Um, and that also goes for schools too. I know I'm speaking to an educator audience. Um, as a Title IX attorney, I've heard way too many stories from school resource officers, which is a euphemism for school cops, they're not resources, um, school cops who are dating high school girls. Um, and of course that's not dating, um, that is adult men with weapons, with guns, sexually abusing children. Um, moreover, 40% of cops have been reported for domestic violence, and that really is only the number that we know of, even though, again, we know DV, as with sexual misconduct, is underreported. Um, and so in light of all of this overwhelming evidence, one question that you know, we asked to our membership, one question that I always ask to people when I talk to them about why cops need to go is, you know, why do you believe that cops are helpers? When have they ever helped you? Or do you just think that they're helpers because you've seen so many years and decades of police propaganda on TV shows and in the movies? Um, and so, yeah, those are some of the points that we brought up. I wanna be conscious of time, um, but in summary, you know, th the point that we were trying to make with our statement and the point that we were trying to drive home to our membership um, during all of these meetings we had during the town hall um, is that, you know, the system of policing is not um, broken. It's actually working exactly as it was intended. It's working uh, as it was intended when it was founded, um, which is to uphold both white supremacy and capitalism. And we think that driving home both of those points and making them intertwined and making sure that labor union members understand that cops are antithetical to our purpose as labor unions um, is really important. So I'll stop there, but um, I'm happy to answer more questions. Thank you for that. That was tremendous. Much appreciated. And I think some of our attendees are already typing in the chat, which is totally cool. If something really, uh, you know, catches your eye and you want to address it, feel free. But hopefully we'll have time at the end for some direct Q&A. I wanted to go now to another union campaign similar to NCU. And this is one that's waged by SEIU. Uh, we have a panelist here who is an education worker with the Workers United Southern Region Local 32, which is part of SEIU and part of the SEIU Drop the Cops campaign. So Calvin, if you wanted to talk a little bit about the work that you've done in your union, how you got involved in the Drop the Cops campaign and what you're up to uh, with the campaign. Yeah, let's see, thank you so much. So, um, SEIU Drop the Cops is like, a, it's a relatively recent formation. Um, like my, the best of my understanding of No Cop Unions is, was also formed in response to um, the George Floyd protests. And of course, this doesn't necessarily mean that no one in SEIU was um, aware of the contradictions in being in a union that um, protected police officers in this sort of like paradoxical way. Um, it was simply we hadn't had the ability to find each other yet. So. Um, on June 12th, uh, Atlanta Police Department officers um, extrajudicially lynched Rayshard Brooks. Um, they are protected by the National Association of Government Employees, International Brotherhood of Police Officers, Local 623, which is an SEIU um, local that's based in Atlanta. 
Um, I, you know, I'm also a unionist in SEIU and the Southern United States. I have a very different understanding of what the union should be doing um, than those police officers. And so as this happened, different members of SEIU were able to get in touch with each other and we were able to form uh, a, something of a committee to begin carrying forward the process of doing police disaffiliation work. Um, it's important to note that separate from uh, no cop unions, um, we do have a slightly different approach because we have a different structure of our union. So the AFL-CIO is, is a union of unions um, that is not a parallel to SEIU, which is itself a single union, even though it has over time sort of moved in the direction of a union of unions. Uh, I mentioned the National Association of Government Employees. I'm in Workers United Southern Region. And so SEIU can sometimes look like AFL-CIO, but it is, it is a different entity in important ways. Um, we're part of the Change to Win Federation, which is much closer to AFL-CIO, and we're in there with the Teamsters, um, which represent the police officers in Raleigh, who um, were the people who were beating me during the George Floyd protests um, in the past months. I think one of the central insights of police disaffiliation work is that um, I think Elizabeth especially laid out very compellingly the case for you know either abolition or something that looks very much like it, a, a transformational view of social change um, that involves the end of policing as a discipline, which um, you know I sort of think of that as uh, the end of having um, bodies of armed men around that are aligned with the interests of you know cops, bosses, landlords, billionaires, what have you, right? Not my interests, certainly. I think there's like two different um, issues that we have to talk about. And I think disaffiliation to me falls particularly into one of them, which is sort of the tactical side of how we get there. I think there is a rhetorical side um, where we can make as workers the case that cops are not workers. And this is true. Um, cops produce nothing of value. Um, workers produce things of value. So cops are not workers. Um, we can make the case that cops harm us. And of course, this is, this is what police do all the time. But to actually approach a solution to this is, to, in my mind, that's when disaffiliation becomes essential. Um, there was this I idea, and I think Elizabeth brought it up, that AFL-CIO um, cannot defund the police. And I have something of a different view on that, which is I think that AFL-CIO is close to one of the only things that can defund the police. And that's because I do not believe that if we get to a point of defunding or abolition, it will come from an act of Congress or through the United States Supreme Court. I think it will be in response to an exercise of worker power similar to what we saw on Juneteenth. And I think that that's really the only way we can get there. When we talk about whose interests police protect, um, those are the same people that get to decide who the president is going to be. And I, I don't mean the voters, right? Because um, I've been voting for years and my vote has never counted, right? So I, I, I experimentally verified that I do not get to determine who the president of the United States is as a worker. I know that at all points in time, as long as there are police, they will protect their own interests and they will protect the interests of the people that they are aligned with. And those are different from my interests as an actual worker, as a real worker, as someone who's an SEIU as a worker and not as a police officer. However, the union movement does have the power to change this, but we cannot do that while we have police in our unions. As we have police in our unions, they're acting as something of, of an alien interest, right? Um, when I go to my union hall, when I talk to my fellow workers, the central organizing tenant of unionism is that we have shared interests and police do not have those shared interests with us. So every worker in SEIU has the shared interest of abolition or of defunding or of what have you. But unfortunately, we cannot organize towards those ends within the context of SEIU because cops keep showing up to our meetings because on paper, cops are part of a union, when of course such a thing is impossible because cops are not workers, right? So I view the goal of SEIU Drop the Cops as to move SEIU into a position where it can actually utilize the power of the workers in SEIU to enable transformational social change to get us to a point of abolition or defunding. And so that's, the, I think, the two things that are going on here. And we have, we have to be careful not to confuse them, which is we have to convince ourselves and be aware of the nature of policing and what's going on with it. But we also have to understand how we are going to get to the next step. And I believe drop the cops. I believe no cop unions are part of that. So that's why I'm here. And that's what I want to talk about. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Thank you, Calvin. Next up, I'm just going to go again to my right. And we have Rosa Jimenez, who is with UTLA or United Teachers Los Angeles. For those who don't know, UTLA has been involved in a campaign to eliminate police from K through 12 campuses in the 
Los Angeles Unified School District and to redirect uh, resources and funds to student services and the like. And uh, there's been quite a lot of excitement at the K through 12 level in terms of trying to get police out of schools. I know in Oakland, they were su successful in doing that. In Chicago, they've been pushing for it as well. So Rosa, would you mind telling us a little bit about the work that you're doing in Los Angeles and how UTLA came to push uh, to get cops off K through 12 campuses and how that works going? Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, like I said, um, I'm, my name is Rosa Jimenez. I'm a, I'm a history teacher here in Los Angeles and member of United Teachers Los Angeles. I'm, I'm an area chair, um, just a part of the structure of our union. I'm a board of director and I'm also a member of the bargaining team. Um, I represent kind of the central, you know, LUSD and UTLA are, are massive and I represent sort of the central, the northeast parts of our union. I'm also an organizer in a um, grassroots organization known as Students Deserve um, that uh, is, is a student-led space that um, has been fighting to make Black Lives Matter in school. So I kind of have my foot in lots of different spaces. So I, can, I can tell a little bit about sort of the different, um, the different places from which this work was coming from, has been coming from um, over the last few years. And I, I think that's what I wanted to maybe start with is just recognition, right, that um, this, this has been work um, that has been happening for many years now in Los Angeles and where we actually have fought for some reforms, right, um, which I do think sometimes reforms are, are good, right, they open up the door, right, for conversations, um, for, for opportunities to, 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 for folks to, to look at things, right, um, in a different way maybe that they haven't looked at. So, in this past June, we, we were um, able to um, get the school board to cut the police budget by 37% or $25 million. So LAUSD has a, a police budget of over seven, $70 million. Um, and we were able to cut that by 37% um, and then get uh, them to say that those that money would be um, redirected, particularly to, to Black students. Um, and those things are included to hire more counselors, psychiatric social workers, and other much needed um, support services. Um, I think that the thing that, that, that is you know, critical in understanding this work is that students have actually been really at the lead um, of this work through Students Deserve and through other student organizations. Um, and the, the union has really um, played a role in, in lifting up, right, and in centering um, student voices through this process. And I think that the experiences of students going back to the demands a few years ago around ending racist random searches, which was something that was done to students, not by police, but by counselors and administrators, or the demand to end the use of pepper spray on the hand of school police. Um, those are all things that were, we were able to be successful around primarily because students were able to tell their stories particularly black students um, who were experiencing these things in, in greater numbers um, than everyone else. And UTLA really has role has been to kind of amplify, right, and create space for students to share their stories um, and has played a, a pivotal role in, in supporting, um, um, by supporting um, students. And, um, and that hasn't been easy, right? It has taken uh, many years of organizing within uh, the union um, to, to get other members, right, on board to, to support um, the, the, you know, the, the de-policing, right, of, of our schools. Um, so for example, um, you know, back in, starting back in 2013, you know, we, uh, and, and even before that, we were elected a, a pro progressive leadership in UTLA um, and sort of using that as an opportunity, right? Um, we sort of pushed the union to, to support the ending of random searches, right? By having, by, by co-sponsoring huge events um, to get folks uh, uh, to understand the, the issue, um, the issues that some students were, were facing. Um, and then, you know, uh, leading during the strike, for example, January in 2019, right, um, we not only uh, fought for, um, for, for bread and butter issues, right, like, like um, 
like arrays, right, and, and smaller class sizes and things like that. We also one of the de one of the demands also included, um, you know, ending random searches, or random searches, um, and fighting for what we call community schools, which is which is how we see as as part of you know investing um, in the in the community, particularly the Black community. Um, and then I think you know moving forward, like kind of speaking to a couple months ago, right? It took a lot of internal organizing to get. Um, our board of directors, um, as well as our house of reps, right? That's kind of one some of the structures in our union to support defunding of the school police. And we were successful in passing the motion, um, both in the board of directors and the house of reps in June, which would then eventually put some pressure right on the school board, um, knowing that in the past <laughs> we have gone on strike for issues that were not just directly harming us, but we in fact were fighting for issues that were affecting um, our students, particularly uh, Black students. So um, I, I just wanted to speak to kind of generally like where we, you know, how we've gotten to where we're at and then hopefully there I can talk to some of the, some of the challenges, right, <laughs> around doing this work. So thank you for having me. Thanks, Rosa, appreciate that. And the social movement unionism at the K through 12 levels really inspiring. So thank you for speaking to that. Uh, next up, I'm going to go to Andrew Zhang, who is a member of GEO 3550. He's a graduate student worker at the University of Michigan, and GEO 3550 represents uh, grad students there. For those who haven't been paying attention to labor news as of late, they went on a, a week plus long strike uh, back uh, fairly recently, within the last month or two, and were pushing to get part of the, the strike was based on an abolitionist demand to get police off the University of Michigan campus. And so Andrew, I wondered if you could speak to how you were a, your union was able to generate support for a strike that was um, oriented toward abolition. Like how, how did you get everybody on board? And then how did the strike progress? And, and uh, what did you learn from it? Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Andrew Chung, uh, GEO member. I'm also a PhD student at the economics department. Um, I guess like to start off, it's really important to under, so one thing that probably most people don't know because you're not a member of GEO is that the strike happened in the context of the year that the preceding years of the, the like the, the last academic year, we were in the middle of a contract fight. And so while we were in the middle of a contract negotiations, COVID hit. And as soon as COVID hit, I mean, it just disrupted everything about our organizing, but we pivoted and we've been, as soon as COVID hit, we were organizing for months around COVID demands. As COVID, we were organizing around COVID demands and re receiving absolutely no response from the administration and continue to receive no response from the administration. Like the uprisings around George Floyd happened. And as soon as that happened, we immediately tried to pivot some of our resources to start thinking about what can we do both, not just on campus, but in the community and also in our wider local labor movement to influence what can be going on around policing. I'm gonna focus mostly on like kind of what we ended up doing around the strike, but I'm happy to talk about kind of the other stuff that, we were do, that we've been trying to do and kind of the successes and failures that we've encountered on that front. But in terms of the strike, I think one of the most important things I wanna to emphasize to people about how the policing demands ended up being on paper is that we had been negotiating on our contract about policing for on the last cycle. So for on our, again, on our contract, part of one of our planks was disarm and demilitarize police. We had developed detailed contract language on that issue and we had already started distributing. And so membership was already educated on that matter. And that plank, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, was probably the most controversial plank on, on, our, on, our, on our contract. But because, but nonetheless, like kind of the majority of people voted and supported it. It was controversial because like most planks that we put forward, it's like they get like basically consensus. But this one was like, you know, we had like basically like a 56, 44 split. And that was a substantial difference in compared to some of our other, other planks. And so, you know, going in, our membership was already educated about these issues. They understood that we had been trying along kind of standard negotiation routes to like push forward along the, on the policing demands. We pr offered fairly reasonable and mild policing demands, such as just, you know, get rid of guns on campus, 
pull back some of the funding, not all of it, and start talking about and being a bit more transparent about what is the relationship between our campus police and the universe, like the wider community police. And basically, from the we received like basically we made no headway during the contract negotiation. And I think that kind of set the tone for our membership about where policing was. Is that if you cared about policing, the contract negotiations out of the contract right now were not going to work. That negotiating with administration right now was not going to work. But even given that, even given um, the uprisings that were happening, and yet even that, given that we had already we started mobilizing as soon as that happened to start organizing around it, we started coming towards the point where we were realizing, oh crap, we might have to strike over the COVID demands. So what are we going to do about the policing demands? And the fact of the matter was is that for because of the history that we had had as a union with the administration, and because we knew that like how strong, how basically our traditional allies in, that we could rely on were kind of opposed to these policing demands, we knew that we were not in the strongest strategic position to push forward these policing demands. So leadership going into the strike was really cautious, honestly, about putting forward the policing demands. So how did the policing demands get there? It was entirely by membership, by mem because of membership. At our GMM, at, on the lead up to developing our, our walkout platform, membership brought up a concern about this not being on the demands. Le leadership provided the reasons for why they believe that it was it might not be strategically sound and that they were still trying to figure out what would be the best tack. And membership said, we are energized and ready to move forward on these demands, but we want to move forward on these demands. So, you know, the motion was put forward, the demands were put, put in, the motion was put forward, the kind of the policing working group, which I was a part of at the time, kind of quickly drafted up some uh, a rough sketch of like what these demands would start looking like. That but we put forward a formal proposal to be voted on by membership, and membership voted overwhelmingly to move forward with including policing demands into the work stoppage platform. As soon as that happened, we were scrambling, like we were scrambling to like write out specific. Con like um, like specific language around these kind of demands. We had good contract language on disarming and demilitarizing, but in terms of community policing um, and other forms of kind of, uh, we wanted to basically like expand the profile of our demands. And so that took a lot of effort. And I can talk about, again, I don't want to spend too much time just talking about all this, but, you know, without a doubt, you know, we made a lot of mistakes along the way. We learned a lot of things, you know, you know, by just like kind of trial by fire because we were moving, we felt like we were moving on a really rapid time scale. Like, you know, the, the protests around George Floyd happened. We had like, what, three, four months to like organize ourselves and build like a new set of like, like demands around like striking, around policing. Typically like for a strike like this, like we're organizing for a year. Like, I mean, we're only, we're lucky that the COVID stuff happened like during our contract year because it would be hard to imagine that we would have been as mobilized as we needed to be to be ready to go on a strike because COVID just like was for some people was a mobilizing thing. But in our case, there was a lot of parts about it that was demobilizing. It like really made our organizing a lot harder. Um, but in terms of like kind of specific lessons that I would, I would say that we got out of, just to kind of wrap up about what we got out of this struggle was that, you know, I was, the thing that surprised me the most going into the strike, coming out of the strike as well as the level of solidarity and like an understanding what solidarity meant by our membership. You know, this was one of the more controversial plays on our docket. And also like, even amongst those who support, there's a wide degree of, there's a wide, like a lot of variation. Like if you're want to win this in your union, like, Maybe you're like in a union, like we're a pretty progressive union, we're a pretty militant union, and it's still controversial. And I can imagine that it's also controversial in your unions and your locals. Like, but the thing is, is that within our membership, when we went on strike, everybody knew what that meant. Like everybody understood that there were things that you didn't agree with, there are things that weren't perfectly clear, there are things that you didn't, you kind of agreed with like in principle, but like how it was coming out in practice, you didn't get, but everybody understood that when we're on strike together, we're striking for all of this at this all of it together, and nothing is getting thrown under the bus for that. And so you have to have faith that when those demands are are voted and put through the right process, and you talk to your membership about it, and the membership believes in the legitimacy of that process, 
that they're not going to back down from the strike because you put forward demands that some people disagree with. Those people will still come to the table and they will still join you on the picket line. Um, I think this kind of, the second thing is, is that like throughout the whole process, we had to, we, we did, that being said, we did have to constantly reinforce um, what the demands were, the kind of reminding people about the history that we had to go through to get there so that they didn't feel like we were just like going from like zero to 100 for no reason. Because that was probably the biggest thing that within membership was the concern that we had to we had to combat. Um, the second thing that I think we've learned from the strike in terms of policing demands, especially, but I mean anything, this is like applies to everything really, is like we cannot win this by ourselves. Like as a local, like as a local, we could we're, we can't win these policing demands by ourselves. I mean, we are in the university system, we are a powerful workforce like we're an important workforce and we're a large workforce but we're not the only workforce and I think you have to be prepared for the fact that these demands might rub other workers the wrong way other unions the wrong way probably the two places where we saw this the worst was faculty and like you know faculty they're just like oh like I disagree with like this like some aspect of the policing demands so I'm just gonna like totally just like not stand with you on the strike it's like complete spinelessness to be honest honest it's it was absolutely ridiculous um, there were definitely faculty that were supportive of us and we're deeply thankful for that but I was just kind of in all honesty like you know faculty were basically saying that if it wasn't for the policing demands they would have stood with us and I think that's just practically frankly just kind of again, spineless, pathetic, uh, that just over one set of demands, you're gonna just back away and drop off uh, from the people that you work with. Uh, but kind of another area where we saw uh, problems, but we worked through them was with the trade unions. So uh, the, the, uh, the building trades specifically, so like the, like the construction workers, the glaziers, like the, the metal workers, the people that are working on building like all the buildings like helping to construct all the big buildings and big building projects on our campus these are extremely important projects to the university and hitting them there really matters to them um long story short um we worked it out with them they strongly disagree with us on our demands but they still but by kind of having built those relationships and working with them they respected our picket lines and respected our picket lines at great personal costs and for that we really uh, say thank you to our comrades at, in uh, the building trades. Um, and I think the final thing is just that, like, you know, we didn't win really a lot of the things that we wanted out of the policing demands, but I think that we're aware that, like, you know, a strike, one strike doesn't win you policing demands. Um, the reality is, is that, you know, the strike helped, I think, you know, mobilize people around these demands, help people educate people on these demands. But also there's a lot of people that are just not gonna be convinced in the process of a strike. And that's just natural. Um, it's not a bad thing about that person. It's just, it's just like some people, you know, uh, they're just, it takes a little bit, it's a little bit more of a gentler approach <laughs> that you need to have to convince them about policing demands. And um, I think we're aware of that and we're aware that we need to keep moving forward on uh, when fighting for those demands and like convincing not only our membership, but the broader kind of community at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor about why these demands are important and so that we can move forward and win those demands again. again because we don't believe that we're gonna win these demands by kind of the, tr the normal partnership relationship that you could have with your boss where you have like a negotiation and all that kind of stuff. Like we're gonna, policing demands are gonna be won like in the streets in a strike by forcing the hand of administration and there's no other way about it because administration does not want to give up on these, does not want to give up on these demands. Like you can, we can just, it's just very clear about that. So with that, I'm just going to kind of wrap up. Thank you, Andrew. That was incredibly informative and I'll personally continue to follow GEO's organizing and solidarity efforts with interest. And we'll make sure to come back to everybody with, we have plenty of follow-up questions and I know the attendees do as well. So uh, I did not intend to slight Dylan by skipping over him in my order here, but I figured I'd go with the cops off campus folks at the end, both Dylan and Ken. Uh, I know Amanda's also been involved and we have folks in our UCAFT Committee on Policing who have been involved in the cops off campus campaign and movement as well. Uh, I'm going to 
give both Dylan and Ken a chance to speak. Whoever wants to jump in uh, first is fine. Uh, Dylan is a professor of media and cultural studies at UC Riverside. Ken is a lecturer in the art department at UC Riverside. And both uh, have been involved in the UC wide, and I think it even extends beyond that because I know there are folks in the California State University system who are on board as well, but the UC wide cops off campus campaign and movement and with the uh, UCR branch or chapter or local, or I'm not sure exactly how y'all are referring to it, but uh, you're really doing that work here um, in Riverside and in connection with folks across the UC system. And I know Ken had reached out to me uh, because I'm the communications VP for our UCAFT local at UCR and informed me about the, the stuff they're doing with Cops Off Campus, which I was not totally privy to. And so I want to give everybody who's in attendance a chance to learn more about the work that you're all doing in the university system. And so Ken or Dylan, whoever wants to, to jump in, and it'd be great to hear from both of you and how you both got involved. I insist that Ken speaks first. I'm going to follow Ken. Go, Ken. Okay, well, I think of Dylan as a mentor, so I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna take I'm gonna I'm gonna follow uh, those instructions. But um, I just want to say thanks for organizing this to James and Stephanie, and appreciate being in conversation with you all about it. Um, I, I, as James mentioned, I'm a lecturer, longtime lecturer in the art department at UC Riverside, and I've been involved with abolition work for a long time. I, I've been a volunteer for Critical Resistance in Los Angeles, which is a, an organization that if you don't know about, Dylan's actually one of the co-founders of, but it's um, a group that was founded more than 20 years ago and has been working on um, abolitionist organizing around the prison industrial complex. And I think I would just, as by way of introduction, I would say, I think it's important to acknowledge that you know, figures like Angela Davis, people like Ruth Wilson Gilmore, the kind of scholarly and activist work that their careers represent form the kind of basis for the kind of work that we're trying to do. And really thinking about how we can reimagine the university structure entirely. So I think speaking for myself, but I think this is widely shared across the Cops Off Campus campaign, Part of what we're interested in is rethinking the structure of the university. And we see that the goal of getting cops off campus is a means towards that long-term end. And part of thinking about that has to do with a kind of feminist ethic, an anti-racist ethic, um, thinking about how we bring uh, forms of policing into the classroom and into university structures and working on trying to undo that in all of the work that we do. So what's important about the Cops Off Campus campaign to me is that it's a part of this broad effort to really rethink what the university is doing in the world, right? And at least for myself, I would say I've been influenced by people like Fred Moten and Stefano Harney and they're writing about undercommons and thinking about how we can take and leverage the resources of the university towards uh, a kind of transformational uh, social, broad social and political practice, right? So I think that to echo some of what's been said already, I think that for me, what's exciting about this campaign is that it presents us an opportunity to improvise and experiment with this idea that we know that getting cops off campus is a limited um, opportunity for what it would mean to really transform the university, but it's a meaningful one. And it goes to the heart of some of the critical questions that those of us who've been working on these issues for a while seek to undertake. So um, I think that the, the practical strategy of how we get cops off campus in a year um, is a really difficult practical set of questions that we're beginning to wrestle with. And we also are really interested in keeping in mind this longer term horizon that is like an abolition, abolitionist framework that allows us to create a kind of new world and thinking about how the university actually is well positioned for this kind of work. 
Um, and so I'll, I'll leave it there and I'll just um, hand it over to Dylan who can probably more articulately uh, get to some of that. That was brilliant, Ken, I appreciate that. Um, though Ken, Ken I, I, I'm on board with everything Ken said. So I think uh, that, that allows me the luxury of maybe elaborating on some key points uh, that will kind of put the UC FTP, by the way, it's called UC FTP, it's called UCR FTP at UCR. FTP for me stands for fuck the police, for other people it stands for free the people, for the people it stands for feed the people. FTP kind of means what you want it to mean, but um, I insist on, on it uh, meaning fuck the police, fuck the police. Um, and the reason I say fuck the police as often as I possibly can, um, and the reason why I think the abolitionist campaign to get rid of police at UC campuses in a year is so important um, is, is there's several folds to this. On the one hand, I think, I think as teachers, as educators, as scholars, all of us on this call, um, whether or not your profession is teaching, right? You, you, we all need to be teachers right now and we all need to be students right now. Part of that for me entails encouraging all of us to build a much stronger literacy, collective, shared, critical literacy around the centrality of the black radical and black liberation tradition to the thing we're calling abolition. That is for some bizarre reason very weak right now in a lot of the circulating um, uh, platforms, organizing and rhetorics of abolition. It, it, there's a strange way that, that I think that it's been disconnected from the long historical traditions of black radicalism. So I think we need to, to center that um, in every possible way because what that then does is it pushes us to rethink the very history of the police presence in different places, including and especially university campuses. So let me, let, me, let me use the University of California as an example. There is this dominant narrative that situates the emergence of UC police forces as an administrative repressive response to really white protest, meaning the anti-war movement and the free speech movement. That is not really what the origins are, you all. Um, that's one part of it. But, but I would argue, following scholars who have spent much more time on this than I have, that, that the existence of UC police really derives from an institutional and state reaction, number one, to nationwide black student rebellions on campuses, focused on campuses, principally pushing for, number one, the end of US apartheid, and linked to that, um, black studies, right? Um, my, I did my undergraduate degree at a university at Cornell, where the origins of Africana studies were an armed student takeover of the main building on campus during parents weekend. Right. Um, there's a, you've probably seen the image. There's these famous images of black students at Cornell 1968 uh, doing it is actually fully legal too, right. It was an illegal armed takeover of Willard Strait Hall on Cornell's campus. That's why you have university police. Right. Um, it, it, it's it's in, in some ways it is no different than the moment we are in now where there's a broad state tolerance of basically white people and to a secondary extent, non-black people exercising fully their mythified second amendment right to bear arms. Um, and then on the, I, I don't even wanna say polar opposite. It, it, there's an asymmetry to this, right? In a different planet, uh, an armed state response against black people, not even armed black people, but black people. So. So part of what we need to understand about the origins of policing is that this is a response to nationwide black student rebellions in the UC system, the Thurwood Liberation Front, right, which had a significant black student union presence. Uh, and we, we again tend to abstract this from the university, the Black Panther Party, right? The, 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 rise, of, the rise of police or police departments in California you know, campuses is principally a response to the rise of the Black Panther Party throughout California in particular, but nationwide, of course, but through Oakland and LA. That's okay, so that's, that's the first thing I wanted to say as far as what we are actually dealing with here, right? That the origins of policing in the UC system are deeply a response to Black freedom struggle in all of its different phases. Um, which leads me to say that part of what fuels the campaign for me, both um, uh, kind of conceptually, rhetorically, politically, analytically, and otherwise, is that uh, policing, as as uh, one of our one of our attendees, you know, formulated the question, right, about you know what happens when what happens what happens when somebody's at my door, you know, and I and I want to call nine one one. What what the, what that question raises is what I would consistently call the asymmetry of policing, right? Policing is domestic war, 
right? That's actually what it is. And that's not me saying that. That is the police in the state saying that. They, they, they frame it as a form of domestic war. The, the principal issue that's at stake that I think we tend to underanalyze and under theorize is that it is asymmetrical, meaning that it is war that is waged on behalf of some of us against particular targeted peoples, right? That's why it's such a difficult thing to kind of win universal um, abolitionist uh, opposition to, right? Because people actually feel, and sometimes they're correct, that the asymmetrical war is being waged in state, on their behalf, right? And so that's, that's part of this, right? Which is, which is to say then, and I'll stop after this, that our problem is not only, it, it's not merely that reform-based reform visions and platforms are insufficient, or that they don't work. The problem is that reforms actually do work. The reason we're in the fucking mess we're in is because reforms do work. Um, they work in multiple ways. Reforms primarily, more than anything else, are created in order to sustain an existing violent system when that system is under abolitionist duress, right? I'll say it one more time because I know it's a, it's, a, it's a mouthful, but I've been thinking about this for a long time, as you can probably tell. The, the reason why we have to not only be abolitionists, but we have to actually actively be critically oppositional to certain kinds of reform is because reforms do the work of sustaining existing violent systems, especially state systems, when they are under abolitionist duress. We are in that moment right now, right? I wasn't sure that I would ever experience it in my fucking lifetime, that there would actually be a moment where, 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 where this institutionalized form of anti-black colonial state violence, you know, anti-trans homophobic, you know, patriarchal misogynist state violence would actually be under abolitionist duress. We are in the moment now. So I think it's a responsibility we have to seize on that and ask abolitionist questions, right? To center abolitionist analysis, to draw from black radical and black liberation traditions um, collectively to circulate them, to study them, to deploy them in our organizing st strategies, including and beyond labor unions. Um, I think in, in every possible space that once we raise the questions differently and, 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 and once we deal with reform, especially reformism, right? Reformism as a kind of philosophy that sees reforms as the outermost horizon of political action, right? That's, that's the thing we really need to fight is reformism. Um, then, then I think we actually change everything we do. Um, and that's, and again, we, we're in a moment where there's traction around that in a shared collective way. And so I just think that we got to stop falling back on notions of universal, universally shared interest and just tell people, you know, you have to fucking choose a side. You know what I mean? Are, are you for black genocide? Are you for anti-black genocide? Are you for, you know what I mean? The, 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 the racial colonial violence of policing, or are you against it? That is what the historical moment is calling on us to do is to choose a side. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna shut up now. Wow, um, you all have said so many things. You have my palms sweating and I have multiple pages of notes here running. Um, where to dig in as far as taking the direction of this uh, amazingly beautiful conversation. One thing I wanna recognize here is the diversity within our spaces and our places. And I think in some ways this helps uh, lend to me a more philosophical question that I've had, I think that intersects really nicely with this larger conversation about policing and really how we, abolish police or put an end to um, the sort of radical and, and racialized state violence that we have either read about, been a part of, um, or have observed and witnessed in our own lifetime. So for me, a fundal, fundamental question here is really, uh, I think, having to do with this idea of pragmatism and tactics, right? Um, and I think that this has brought some of us into discussions of reform versus abolition and, and, and ways and strategies um, to deal with this problem. But I think fundamentally, philosophically for me, I still have a question you know, when I think of the images that I see of our good brothers and sisters out there fighting the good fight in the street and the kind of actual real military state violence that they come up against, um, how do we deal with the aggressor without ourselves becoming the aggressor? So can di civil disobedience and nonviolent action really change the world the way that it needs to be changed? Is peace, peace really myth? Is our goal and objective here a mythologized project? And if not, how do we actualize it? What are some of the tactical strategies um, and methods that, that we can actually begin to act on um, and move beyond discussion and conversation, especially when it comes to this sort of aggressor um, aggression that we see taking place so often? 
Damn, you went deep there, Stephanie. I appreciate it. Did you want to throw that open to any of the panelists? Yeah, whoever feels like they want to munch and chew, definitely. Go ahead, Amanda. I think the framing of that question is really difficult because we have to understand like the narrative of the state and who controls the labeling of something as violence. Um, when we see the way police assault, it is assault, uh, black people in the streets during the uprisings, when we see the way white supremacists are allowed to drive their cars into crowds um, of people protesting, uh, we, we have to understand that the state has monopoly on violence and labeling actions as violent. They choose to not label their own as violence and to label any resistance, and this goes into kind of um, Fadon, um, any resistance to state violence is seen as violence, whether or not you are committing violence. People will say that breaking a Starbucks window at a protest is violence. That's not violence. That's property damage, right? It's starvation is violence. Oppression is violence. Um, what's happening in the streets, uh, downtown Riverside during our first um, uprising here, uh, the police closed off the 91 freeway and drove a tank off of it. Um, they were shooting rubber bullets uh, directly at people. Um, there's even, I believe, KTLA accidentally, which is great because it was on accident, recorded police uh, breaking car windows. So you can see the drone zooming in. And then when they saw what the police were doing, the drone camera zooms out. Um, so it, we're not the ones being violent and any resistance we have towards state sanctioned violence, which they label as peacekeeping, which they label as um, law and order. Uh, really, it's by whom for whom, which I think kind of gets at what Dr. Rodriguez was saying, you know, the state is protecting some at the cost of pretty much everybody who's not like a cishet white landowning male. Um, right. So we have to think about like what violence actually means and how we define it. Um, because we're not the ones being violent. Um, I don't think it's violence to defend yourself, but anything we do in resistance is always labeled as violent. I, I kind of want to add on to that. I, I mean, Amanda, I think that was so well said. And what, what you got me thinking about was, I think one of the greatest acts of violence that's recently been perpetuated was um, the poisoning of an entire town in Flint, Michigan. That's extremely violent. And our current system has never held anyone accountable for that act of violence that is killing, sickening, and uh, poisoning people of all ages for, for years. And um, when, when I started thinking, I, I think like in, in addition to way, the way Amanda was describing that we need to reframe how we think of violence, I think we also need to reframe how we think of safety, which I think also gets at one of the, um, one of the attendees questions, which is a fantastic question that I, I consider myself very new to abolition and I went through that process of like, what do we do with the violent criminals? Or what do we, you know, what do, if, who am I supposed to call if I can't call the police? And what I've had to think about is like, the police to me are not safety. They, they are safety theater. They really are safety theater. And their they're, they're violence sold us as safety. And I think other people have, have uh, who spoke put, put it even much better than I could about how they're, you know, um, they're sold to a portion of the population as safety when they actually are just targeting their violence in a domestic war against a certain section of the population that does usually doesn't look like me. <laughs> um, and so I've had to think about all the times I've interacted with police and how most of the times police, you know, uh, a friend of mine wound up dead in the river, in the LA river, and the police uh, tried to rule it a suicide without really investigating, decided it was an accident when there were actually a lot of fishy circumstances. And it's been three years and we still have no answers. And they, um, they actually bullied his widow and did more work to try to prevent her from getting answers uh, than they did to try to get the answers in the case. And I have multiple friends who, who've been the victims of violence, for like sexual assault, who were told by police like, they were either harassed by the police so that like why they got assaulted in the first place or were sent away, you know, because the police are like, there's nothing we can do. And so I think, I, I don't know that I'm ready to shoot with the larger question of like, is, is pure peace possible? But I do think we have to watch our, look at our definitions of, um, I, I think we have come to understand as a society, we, we think that punishment is justice. I think we've been tricked into thinking punishment is justice. And I know many people who were saying defund the police were super excited to see that um, 
you know, uh, that one police officer, the blonde woman who shot the innocent person in his own apartment because she thought, I, I don't remember the names of the case, but she claimed she thought it was her own apartment and she, she shot a man like eating ice cream uh, just in his own apartment, right? And she was sentenced and there was a lot of celebration and I was like, oh, unfortunately, you know, we're celebrating sending this woman to jail when we're trying, are, are we abolitionists or not? And these aren't, these aren't easy questions, but it's, it's that um, instinct in, in ourselves, I think, to see, to see punishment um, and, you know, we have to start thinking about what is justice? What is restorative justice? How is justice actually accomplished? Thanks for that, Alexis. Much appreciated. And if it's okay with all of the panelists and with my co-moderator, Stephanie, I, I want to open it up and disrupt things a little bit. And so if panelists have questions for each other, feel free to raise those. And likewise, if there are attendees who have questions, you can type the question into the chat or into the Q&A. We do have one sitting in the Q&A, and so I want to go ahead and get that because get to that because uh, I think it was it was offered up very early on. And so the uh, Crystal in the in the chat or in the Q&A asked, "I have a question for all panelists." What encourages you about the business union model? Have you seen union bosses with the AFL-CIO promote abolition or disaffiliation? Do you think they are meaningfully separate from the people whose interests lie with white supremacy and capitalism? And I appreciate this question because full disclosure, I'm a, a dual card carrying member of both UCAFT and the industrial workers of the world. And the IWW has a pretty long standing critique of business unionism. And I think this question also gets at that, um, that broader question of working within reformist structures, what's possible and what the limitations are. Is there anybody who would like to field that? I know we have two folks from NCU who have some AFL-CIO um, affilia affiliation. So I don't know if you wanted to address it or if anybody else does. Oh, Calvin, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll just... Um, be brief on this. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm dual card IWW as well. Um, before I was in SEIU, which is a cop union, I was a member of uh, UE, which is um, does not organize police. Um, in fact, you know, the most successful unions don't organize police. I think the question of business unions is uh, like fairly straightforward. It's, it's they're bad. I mean, the union bureaucracy is bad. It's my class enemy. They command the police and they work with them. Um, when Black Lives Matter protesters reached the AFL-CIO national offices in Washington, D.C., they got a statement of support from ATU 629, um, which is the ATU union in Washington, D.C. So, um, like the AFL-CIO is an entity similar to the SEIU International, um, is like in many ways hostile to my interests. I don't think that that's necessarily the point as much. And again, I, I just want to recenter this on like, how are we going to get to where we're trying to go? Like. Um, Dylan talked about, we sort of have this like ongoing genocide of black people in America. It seems like we should stop that. Um, and I think that the way we have to do that is we have to do that by organizing workers to something that looks like a general strike, which doesn't have to be a general strike, but somehow we have to prevent the ability of the state apparatus of violence to continually be deployed against black people in the United States and abroad. I mean, I don't think we should um, pretend that AFRICOM isn't doing the same thing, you know. So. The important thing for me is not like, is the AFL-CIO like cool and good? Is SEIU cool and good? I, that, that's irrelevant. Like my role, my responsibility is I have to go stop this somehow. And the way I view to stop this is by organizing workers. Now, that's going to probably look like a union. It doesn't have to look like a union. But I think that that's the way you're going to have to do it. You know, I'm not going to gain access to nuclear weapons at any time soon. You know, that's something the state has. Um, I'm not going to create a standing army of millions of people. Um, but one of the things I can do is prevent the buses from carrying um, riot police to protest. And that's like a, a straightforward thing a labor organizer can do. And that's what I can do today um, to create conditions under which people are actually safe and not necessarily just protected by police. So that's my two cents on that. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just quickly add, um, you know, Richard Trumka, who's the head of the AFL-CIO, has explicitly said that he does not support disaffiliating from cop unions. He said he doesn't support that. And so it's an uphill battle for us. Um, so yeah, and I echo what Calvin said. I also like wanted to add a little bit more context about, you know, why would you not want to call the police? Um, first of all, for most incidents that happen, by the time the police arrive, um, the, the harm has already passed. 
Um, and what a lot of people will do is they need to go to the police station and record what happened. Um, but the police will not actually stop the harm from happening. And further, even if they do engage in um, pressing charges or going through prosecution, um, the the legal standards are very high and the police have a lot of discretion and prosecutors have a lot of discretion and when to even go forward with a criminal case. And so even when all of that happens, it's very unlikely that the victim will actually receive any um, any restoration for the harm that they that they um, suffered. Um, and further, a criminal process is between the state um, and the criminal defendant. The victim is not a stakeholder in that process um, and they don't gain anything out of that. Um, what many victims, for example, of gender-based violence want is an apology and an admission that what happened happened and that it harmed them. Um, and the criminal justice system, the criminal legal system, because it's not a just system, the criminal punishment system is set up for criminal defendants to deny what happened. So even if the harm did occur, they're incentivized to say that it did not occur. And so the path to healing really isn't there. Um, and Further, in terms of like when, you know, you may not want to call the police, um, we talked a lot about, um, we heard a lot of great thoughts about um, Black genocide. Um, I'll also add that Indigenous people um, actually experience the highest rates um, of police brutality. 50% um, of people who are killed by cops are disabled, um, and that's not really talked about. Um, and so in terms of like why you wouldn't want to call the police, um, there are a lot of different groups of people who are already marginalized um, in general society and disproportionately experience violence from the state um, who would not want to call the police. Um, domestic violence is another incident um, and type of incident that I want to talk about. Um, I mentioned earlier 40% of cops are DV abusers, domestic violence abusers, and that's just the reported number, so it's probably a lot higher than that. Um, so if you call the cops about a domestic violence incident, oftentimes cops will just side with the abuser. Um, and even if they do respond, even if they do side with the victim, what they often will do is force victims to participate in the criminal proceedings in a way that is harmful, is against their consent. Um, what DV victims usually want is for the violence to stop. They often do not want their abuser to go to prison. Um, they, they're in a romantic relationship with their abuser. Their abuser is oftentimes co-parenting um, with them with their children. Um, and perhaps they need housing security and having um, their abuser go to prison is going to take that away from them. So there are a lot of reasons why that's not a solution um, that makes people safer. Um, further, when you do um, call the cops and your abuser, what will often happen is that the violence itself escalates um, when the person comes back. And so for all those reasons, um, the criminal legal system is not um, a overall helpful response to something like domestic violence. Um, and then on top of that, um, when police arrive to resolve or to address or sometimes escalate um, a DV incident, what can often happen is that it'll trigger a nuisance ordinance, um, which means that the victim of domestic violence will then often be, um, can be evicted from their homes because their landlord can invoke um, some sort of city ordinance. Um, and so, yeah, there's just a lot of different tricky issues that arise. And I think like these sort of hypothetical questions that are very broad, like, well, what do I do when, you know, something happens and I want to call the police, don't really get at the, the realities of how it actually plays out. Um, and so I, I don't know if, I, I, I kind of just want to talk a little bit about some non-police alternatives. Um, one thing that, you know, I'm in DC, we're trying to defund um, the Metropolitan Police Department here in DC. And things that we've talked about are divesting from police funds and then reinvesting those funds into other non-police resources, other social, uh, into social goods um, that can actually help keep communities safe because cops don't keep us safe. Um, for starters, we can invest some of that funding into COVID-19 relief, um, and that's very important. Um, we can expand non-police responders funding. Um, these are, these are non-law enforcement people who respond to emergency calls, whether that's for medical or mental health, um, whether that, those are social workers. And I add a caveat to that because um, social workers can also act as police. So I'm not saying that social workers are a be all end all solution and a replacement for all types of um, um, situations that are currently being addressed by the police, but this is a start. Um, we wanna expand violence prevention and violence interruption programs. Um, here in DC, we have something called Cure the Streets. Um, and these are folks who have um, been through the criminal legal system oftentimes, but they're um, working within their communities to stop violence and to interrupt violence. Um, it's been shown to be very effective. Um, in terms of funding for schools, we can 
we can invest in non-police adult helpers in schools, um, people who are not school resource officers, or um, which is the euphemism for school police. Um, we can invest in guidance counselors and nurses and psychologists um, and social workers. And again, I say that again with the caveat that oftentimes white women who are social workers often act as police um, substitutes. And so they're doing the same work at the police by um, funneling um, black and brown children through um, the school to prison pipeline. But if you're able to invest in these people who are helping um, with mental health supports, um, that does create better learning outcomes for everyone. Um, I don't have the statistics on me right now, but the ACLU had a great report um, and it had numbers on, you know, how many schools, how many children go to schools where they have um, school police, they don't have any nurses, they have zero psychologists, zero guidance counselors, um, but they have school police in their schools. And it's just, the, the numbers are extraordinary, it's in the millions. And it's really alarming in terms of what we're prioritizing when it comes to educating our children and keeping them safe. Um, I also wanna talk about housing, how basic access to housing, to food and nutrition, um, to job assistance, um, funding for services for um, reentering citizens, people who are formerly incarcerated, helping them find um, jobs and helping make sure that they can find housing. All of these are also very important um, to keep in mind because um, when we think about who is actually experiencing sexual violence, for example, um, the vast majority of people in women's prisons and jails, and that includes um, trans people, are, um, and are people who have experienced sexual violence at some time in their lives. And if you compare that number to the number of people who have been imprisoned for sexual violence, those, the difference in there is so stark. And so um, if we actually want to keep people safe, um, if we actually want to prevent harm from happening, um, it's much more important to reinvest the massive amounts of money that we're putting into policing and into prisons um, and helping people get access to basic social goods. I'll stop right there. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was really informative. We really appreciate all of the uh, statistics and, and the sort of specific on the ground information and details that you're able to offer us, um, especially for our audience. And I, I kind of want to shift, I think, uh, towards thinking about how all of these movements and these ideas and, and the great work you guys have done uh, can apply to our audience. So ways that our audience members and those who are watching this later can become involved in these movements or ways that everyday citizens or just folks on the ground um, um, what can we what can we begin to advocate as far as help? Um, not everybody's going to have the time, the wherewithal, um, you know, the practical ability to join these actual kinds of movements and do the kind of amazing work you guys are doing. So, where do they start? Right? Um, help help give the audience a little bit of a direction as far as how they how they begin to tap into this these important movements um, and actually actualize some of these really fantastic ideas you guys have. Can I jump in? Please. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think, well, well, just really appreciating what every, everybody's saying and, you know, just kind of rename, right, that from our, from my perspective, like, you know, I'm part of a union that's, has over 33,000 members um, serving 700,000 students um, in Los Angeles and the diversity of political opinions and relationships, right? And um, relationships with law enforcement and just this, it, it's just so varied um, and geographically so different, right? We go from San Pedro um, all the way up into the valley, up into the West Valley, right? Who tends to be, tends to be a very conservative area. So I think in some ways teachers right the, the the educators that we're trying to move on this stuff are, are very much a reflection of what we're dealing with right um in real life and so that's very different from maybe folks who are on here who already have read these incredible books right and have all these incredible statistics um that they can just drop right and and so i guess what i wanted to say is um in terms of like what what we need to do and what uh what our spaces that we're part of can help to do and can help to facilitate is to um, try to help and encourage people to have these very difficult conversations, right? Um, as you know, somebody posted a question in the in the chat earlier about what do I do with you know if a cop comes to my door, like those are the questions that come up all the time, 
and if we ourselves and the leaders in our in our union spaces are not trained or not um have not had the up, like under, understanding of like how do i have these conversations with people who have experienced trauma this is where these questions are coming from right like i have experienced something really bad happen to me and i don't know what i'm going to do without police whether that be a city police right or a, or a university police but in our case, right, it's school police, right? We have teachers saying, well, I had a kid once who threw a chair at me, right? And like, what am I, you know, what am I gonna, what am I supposed to do without school police, right? Or what if there's drugs or what if there's guns, right? So these are, they're coming from places of experience. And if we're not pushing ourselves, we're not pushing our unions to encourage these conversations to be happening throughout the structures in which we, we meet, right? Um, then you know not, nothing's going to shift right like I, I really appreciate um appreciate what dylan um and, and eric said um about like we are we're, we're you we're doing this work to also create something different right and in order to be able to create something different are, are we are going to actually also have to heal ourselves right um from our own trauma and from our own experiences and that starts now right that starts by having these conversations and and looking for those alternatives, um, uh, you know, as Elizabeth spoke to, yeah, we definitely, we could use some more counselors, we could use some more psychiatric social workers, and that might actually prevent, you know, and, and, and make sure that a kid doesn't throw a chair across the room, right? Those, those are, that stuff is real, and it doesn't get through necessarily to people who have these deep traumatic experiences. So I wanted to name that as like, as part of our work is one is like, how, how are we having these conversations where how are we creating space for that? Um, and then again, reiterating, like how are we centering, centering the people who are most impacted by this, right? So who are the black students, right? In our case, who are the black parents? Who are, who are the, the, the students um, on our campuses that we serve, right? That we are listening to and that we're creating space to hear their stories. Um, and they should be out in front. They should be the ones co-creating demands um, with with us, right? So that um, we're we're able to to win, um, not in, just in the short term, but in the long term. We have these massive budget cuts coming up, right? And we may all be facing job losses, right? If we're if we don't have if we're not protected in some way. So how do we make sure that we continue to hold up these police uh, defunding police demands while fighting? um while fighting budget cuts right how do we con con connect those things um and make sure that we don't just drop it because we're now we're, we're fighting to save our jobs one of the name that thank you amanda did you want to ask a question a fellow panelists or were you just throwing that out there i think i was just throwing it out there when we're talking about like trauma of like a, t a teacher and an unruly student um what about the trauma of having cops in schools and what that does to students um, we know personally at UCR, we've had two UCR PD officers that have assaulted black students while they were touring uh, campus with their parents. Um, and both of those were settled outside of court, like they got money for it, um, but we know our officers have done that. There's another instance when UCR PD were linked to um, UCI and it was the UCR officers who assaulted and detained illegally a UCI student exiting a building during a COLA protest, a cost of living adjustment protest. Um, we have to understand that police cause just as much trauma as what they're supposed to prevent, if not more, by some of the statistics uh, just dropped into to chat. Um, personally, I have had a police officer pull a gun on me um, when he thought that my vehicle was uh, registered to the previous owner who was Hispanic, and when he saw that I was white, he put his gun away. So these are the kinds of people that we, we are dealing with and that we are talking about. Um, they shoot first, they pull their gun out first, and they traumatize students and they trump we've seen them traumatize our students on campus i have personally witnessed ucrpd as well go up to um uh turning point usa when they've had booths on campus and give them high fives and hellos and for people who aren't familiar with turning point usa um i would label them as a terrorist a white nationalist terrorist organization that puts um a list out of like left and progressive and etc um people on campus to make them targets and these are the people that the police are high-fiving on campus. So we have to remember that the police themselves are a source of trauma, not a protection from trauma. Calvin, did you want to jump in with a quick response to the question about what folks can do at home? 
Yeah, I think this will probably come as a, as a little bit of a, a, I don't know, tangent now. But yeah, I do think it is important to, I, I think it um, reads denialist to me to think that there is a primary source of trauma other than policing or like policing aligned factions. And just like, it's important to have that in mind. By like eliminating policing, you are eliminating some large portion of trauma. And like most of the other sources of trauma are like police sponsored or police protected. Like many of the forms of justice for survivors that are impossible right now are impossible because um, abusers are protected by police. Um, I think that there's like, I have like uh, two things that I keep in mind, like when I'm trying to do things at home and like not everyone has to become a full-time activist though uh, you should consider it. Um, Oh, and those are um, listen to black people and organize your workspace. And these are not like perfect solutions. This is, these aren't the silver bullets, but these are ideas to follow. And they are stand in for things. Like you should listen to oppressed people. Um, like we should be responsive to indigenous land knowledge and to gender oppression and these things as well. And you should look at other forms of organizing other than workplace organizing. But I think there's like, we've spent a great deal of time in here sort of talking about like the hows and whys of abolition. And we like we shouldn't pretend that this wasn't addressed exhaustively by black feminists 20 years ago at length in text and wasn't resolved 400 years ago by indigenous communities in the United States. So like these aren't new or novel solutions. Um, what's new or novel about them is white people listening to them. And so like I have to always be really cautious about that. And you know, I predominantly organize white people because I'm a white worker. Um, like I don't need to always understand that there is um, a legitimate like intellectual and critical response to something, there's just like white fragility under there. And so it's important to have that in mind. I think that um, organizing your workplace is a good way. Like you can do tenants organizing, you don't have to community organize, but I think it's a good idea. Um, to get to the point of a solution, we do have to have, in my view, alternative in place to policing. And so I don't think that police are going to go away when we um, remove all of the causes of crime, because I understand that police aren't around um, to prevent crime, they're around to occupy the United States and, and keep predominantly black people and indigenous people oppressed. Um, that said, uh, we can address that problem by forming our own organizations that are able to resist policing. And so I think that one way to do that is the labor movement. There's other thoughts and there's other techniques, but as a rule, self-educate and prepare to solve the problem. And if you just do those two things as much as you can or in any way you can, that's the right thing to do at home. So again, heuristic, listen to black people, organize your workplace. Thank you. Thanks, Calvin. And again, if our panelists have questions for each other, feel free to ask. And we can also take questions from the attendees if you want to type that into the chat or the Q&A. And I, I had, oh, Ken, go ahead. Um, just really quickly, I, I really appreciate uh, what Rosa brings up. And I just wanted to, to, reflect on that for a minute. Um, and I do think that one of the ways that we can think about the kinds of harm and trauma that people are dealing with is to also acknowledge as we are working with thinking about how to dismantle certain systems, we're also always thinking about how to build up other systems. And part of, I think, what I've learned through working with abolitionists is also that we don't have all of the solutions, right? We have to be cognizant and we have to be clear that if we are transforming the university, if we're getting rid of cops, we don't entirely know what comes next. And part of the transformational work that we're trying to do is grounded in the fact that we don't have all the solutions. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't say to people, there are real strategies that when you have the impulse to pick up the phone and call the cops, here's a set of alternatives. And you know that's stuff that I think that's important work to communicate to people that there are real tangible alternatives. At the same time, I think it's really important to acknowledge that uh, none of us here, certainly not myself, uh, we don't have like a, a prescriptive set of policy solutions that's going to uh, end harm and violence tomorrow. Um, so I just wanted to quickly reflect on that and appreciate that a lot of what people bring to these conversations is pain and trauma and harm. And that's very real. Thank you for adding that, much appreciated. I had a question that I'm gonna direct at both Andrew and Alexis. 
Uh, Andrew, you had raised the importance of building solidarity even beyond your own local in order to advance an abolitionist demand and how you know, going on strike and getting your union on board for getting police off of the University of Michigan campus was insufficient. And so I wanted to ask how you think you can or how is your union going about building solidarity both within your own ranks among your rank and file and beyond your local. And Alexis, I wondered if maybe you could also speak to uh, what, what you're doing with NCU um, within SAG-AFTRA and how you're speaking, how you're talking to other members about, uh, about disaffiliation and that sort of thing. Um, Andrew, if you wanted to go ahead, since I was piggybacking on something you said first. Yeah, I mean, I can go. So our union has kind of three kind of channels by which to kind of tackle this issue. So in terms of community, building community ties, um, the main focus is like we have like a we have a caucus that's specifically focused on doing community outreach and trying to focus on outward facing political demands and community faced political demands. Um, and so we're trying to pivot that like that what we call like the solidarity and political action committee to focus in on those kinds of things to focus in on the policing demands specifically and also as we move forward with kind of trying to mobilize um, kind of undergrads and other kind of other members of the of the campus community uh, we're like we're trying to mobilize those players as well as we're moving forward on our policing demands so one of the kind of wins that we got on the policing demands was to uh, Bring undergrads and undergrad student organizations into the into the room when we're discussing um, what's going to be happening with policing moving forward in Ann Arbor. Um, secondly, kind of in terms of like the broader labor movement in Ann Arbor, there's like the we have this thing called here called the Huron Valley Labor Federation. I forget if it's federation or com committee or something like that, but uh, more or less uh, that is the kind of the main kind of political, like kind of the main like kind of labor, like kind of convening of the labor groups in this area. And we're constantly kind of trying to work in that in that space to try to find other people in our area, other locals in our area that are interested in the same demands as us, because that's the only way that we're going to, that we think we're going to be able to build the kind of, kind of community support for policing demands and kind of making them seem more legitimate to the broader labor movement. The reality is, is that there's just going to be some people in the labor movement that aren't going to be on our side for a while, but we can do things now to try to remedy that in the future moving forward. Um, and we have a role to play in that because like we are like kind of a little bit further out on the left in terms of like these policing demands. We are also just better organized than some of our lo like fellow locals. So we have the power and the will to do that. So we're going to do that. Um, and then in terms of like campus workers, I think that's like going to be a, that's kind of like our biggest challenge is like organizing other people in our other workers at our workplace. Um, we are working on like that on a few different fronts, but I think the main thing that, that comes to mind is, is that, you know, the University of Michigan has multiple campuses. They have campuses at Dearborn and Flint. We need to be organizing there. We've been trying to organize there for the longest time and that needs to continue being a priority. Uh, we, you know, probably two or three contracts ago, we accepted a tiered wage system and that was a mistake. And I think that's a mistake that we've, we've long since realized and it's and something that we are not backing down on anymore. Um, and we're continuing to move forward on that. And I think also insofar as we can, I mean, like we're just one local at the end of the day, we do want to help support our other, other locals in our area with helping them organize. Because the reality is, is that a lot of um, other campus workers were too scared to go on strike with us even though they agreed with us on many of our core demands. Probably the biggest example of this was the lecturers union on our campus, where they're in solidarity with us. They put out a statement saying they wouldn't retaliate against us. They did everything that they could, but they couldn't go on strike with us because they had suffered such severe budget cuts, um, lost so many workers, um, and the membership was scared for, honestly, for a good reason. But I think this goes back to what Rosa was saying is that, you know, they're going to be having other contract fights soon. They're going to be having their, their contract is coming up either this year or next year. And it's our job as GEO to stand with them, show them solidarity, show them that they have no reason to be afraid because we're going to be standing with them. And that's the kind of solidarity that you show that helps breed, I think, the kind of environment on your workplace that makes these kinds of conversations possible. Not just in like the, oh, like that's a great idea, but like in the substantive way of like, actually I'm willing to stand up and fight for these things because I know other people on my, at my workplace have my back. 
Um, so that's what I would say. Alexis, did you want to go ahead and maybe talk a little bit more about your experience with SAG-AFTRA and trying to build solidarity and how you communicate with, with members about that, members and non-members about that? Oh yeah, and I, so I would say that um, since I'm part of NCU and SAG, you know, here's both a rep of NCU and SAG-AFTRA, just to touch on with NCU, it's very easy because NCU is has an abolitionist focus and <laughs> uh, it, it's, it, what I mean by that is like, we don't really have to, you don't have to be as careful with your words when everybody is there um, with a similar mindset and has done a little bit of the reading. And so just uh, kind of to, I, I think Calvin made a great point earlier when they were talking about the necessity of organizing like on, on the line of a general strike or if it's not a general strike, um, you know, uh, some, something to that level. Like for me, NCU is really about building a, a grid or building a network of unions uh, and union members. So for anyone who's watching who is a union member, one way you can get involved is to get your local, get, get other union members in your union that you know and have these conversations with them and call them into this work. You don't even have to come to our meetings all the time, but uh, we do have meetings every, every Thursday at uh, 3.30 Pacific. So uh, I wanted to bring that up just because I think that it's very different from the way we talk about it in SAG-AFTRA. Um, you know, SAG-AFTRA is, it's a union where in order to get the work that most actors want, you have to be union and then you get your card and you kind of forget you're in a union, right? And every so often, you know, the union will send out an email that like, we can't work on this production or there is a strike, we have strikes occasionally, but it's generally specifically striking um, you know, against our, the producers. So for us, I mean, I think having these conversations, it's like, I have found that uh, I have seen a recurring theme in many of the ways that, um, sorry, oh, this phone's so loud. I have seen a recurring theme in many of the ways that SAG after leadership has failed to protect its rank and file. And um, that is sort of the conversation starter that I, I think I have with other members in that we had a recent failure where many of our members were notified in the middle of a pandemic that they were not gonna qualify for health care because our health care plans changed overnight. Um, we also, I've heard from the stunt community that there is a, there's been a longstanding practice of something called paint downs, which is a nice way of saying blackface, where rather than finding a qualified uh, and hiring a qualified stunt person, uh, a black person or a person of color, they'll just hire a white stunt person and paint them uh, to stunt for a person of color. And it's blackface. And uh, certain members of the stunt community are, you know, resistant to change, uh, uh, to give up blackface. So, so I guess um, for me, I have found that it sort of goes, I think, to um, like Dylan's point earlier about like, we're at a point where you need to make a decision, right? Like which side are you on? And I see SAG after leadership is trying to have it both ways on a lot of these issues. They don't wanna upset the entrenched board members who have been doing paint downs for, for decades and, and don't wanna lose that work. They don't wanna upset the, the head of the IUPA or rock the boat at the, at the AFL-CIO level. Um, you know, they don't wanna piss off producers by asking them for more. I, I really do feel like they're doing that. And so thematically, I think one way to, to um, excite uh, the SAG-AFTRA, uh, rank and file is to show them how on multiple issues uh, like they're not protecting labor by trying to have a foot on both sides of the issue and I think too both people within the union who are you know SAG after is probably a pretty progressive union and the Los Angeles local is probably more progressive than than other uh, unions but even among progressives I think you have a lot of people who have a knee-jerk reaction to to abolishing police or defunding police even which is the softer version of abolition that's like how could what about how could we do that and I think it's kind of echoes what I think Rosa really articulated well which is like having understanding that you're 
you have to call people in to the work and maybe, you know, have them reflect on, um, is the system really working now? And this was a year that really showed us that the system is, is um, the system is violent and not not providing safety the way we were told it was. I also think sag after members specifically, we have to reckon with our, <laughs> our role in the propaganda, because as people have mentioned, like propaganda, I mean, who's, you know, I worked on SWAT. I got, I got paid to work on SWAT. You know, I took that money. And I think that we just have, we have to continue to reckon with how, uh, how we have been accomplices in, uh, in many forms of racial injustice. And um, the police issue for me can be, in, within my union can be coupled with some of the issues that come with casting and representation in front of and behind the camera, um, racist uh, practices and hair and makeup where many black members have to provide their own hair, they do their own hair, even on professional sets because producers don't hire people qualified to work with black hair uh, and you know, blackface uh on on the level of stuff so um yeah i guess that's that's it <laughs> thank you for all that many of us aren't necessarily privy to what goes on in the entertainment industry and so i appreciate you sharing and so trying to be mindful of time i figured we could wrap up by giving everybody a chance to provide some final thoughts or sage advice if you have it or you could speak to any six major successes and failures uh, that you have achieved or encountered as a result of the um, abolitionist or defunding or disaffiliation work that you've been doing. And I suppose we can go in the order that we did to begin. And sorry, you have to solve all our problems in two to three minutes because <laughs> because I want to make sure we get to everybody. And so let's go ahead and begin, I guess, with Amanda. If that's cool. I guess um, a couple things have come out of abolition work for me. Uh, there's a coalition of us at UCR, which is really nice and we're growing. Um, it's not just graduate students, it's not just undergraduate students, it's not just faculty, it's not just lecturers, it's all of us and we're bringing in even more people um, because all of us have a reason to be invested in this, especially considering the disproportionate amount, um, speaking of budget cuts, like the disproportionate amount that uh, police and policing get on our campus versus what departments are being told to cut and who they're being told to cut. Um, I guess a lasting thought that kind of goes back to um, Stephanie's question about like violence is when we think about um, abolition and working within the system, we have to remember what Audre Lorde said, and that's that you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. Um, anything that they give us is working within the system and it's reinforcing the system itself. So we have to think outside of what's been given to us and create new ways of moving forward um, and kind of break out of this, like what was America, right? We were founded on um, slave owners, like landowners. We were founded on um, not paying taxes for some reason, like, but yet we are super tied. Eh. Um, but remember who created this system and who the system is designed to benefit and realize that you have to do all of this work outside of the system to move forward. Alexis, I know you just spoke, but did you have any sage advice or final thoughts? Uh, you know, I guess just, uh, it's a long game. <laughs> it's a long game. And I'm so excited to, that, to have panels like this where I can meet other people who are in this work and who've been doing this work for a long time that I can learn from. And I, um, you know, fuck the police. <laughs> Excellent sage advice. Okay, Calvin, do you want to address any of those issues that I raised or final thoughts, sage advice, successes, failures? Yeah, uh, just a few quick thoughts, I think. So, I mean, I think uh, should should take a moment to address failures. I mean, always the biggest obstacle is going to be um, people aligning with the oppressors. That's like, what Americans do. Um, you know, I think I, I'm sort of of the opinion that hopefully I can convince a bunch of my coworkers that policing isn't in their interests. Um, maybe it is in their interests, right? I don't know. I think that's like a difficult political question. But um, I have to get to a point, and we as like activists and workers have to get to a point where we can somehow get some critical mass of people that are, are moving against policing. 
Um, I think that then that's the good news, which is this is the strongest, the movement to create like a real form of justice um, in the area currently occupied by the United States has ever been. Um, I think that um, as we're reflecting and seeing so much police violence and other forms of anti-Black violence, um, there is actually a response to it now in a way that I don't think there ever has been before. And so that is that is a positive thing. I think that's heartening. I think that um, we have a long way to go and we have a lot to do, but um, we really are making progress and it is deeply painful, but we are, we're doing it. And so I feel good about that. So I would just like encourage everyone to um, keep at it and, and keep doing the good work and let's try and get to a point um, where we can actually have a just society. So thank you. Rosa, would you like to say anything in closing? Yeah, just really appreciative as well. It's good to hear from uh, folks in other spaces. I'm not K through 12 um, uh, and help to help reflect on the work that we're doing um, in UTLA um, in Los Angeles Unified. Yeah, I mean, this stuff hasn't been easy. I would say for me, one of the biggest challenges is, is having these conversations with um you know we do have we, we do have a we have white teachers right um, but we also the majority of us are our teachers of color is actually one of the only districts um in in the entire united states where where close to majority are our teachers of color and it is in fact those teachers of color that are many of them are are the ones that we're having the hardest time convincing um to support the defunding of the police. So this conversation around policing, white supremacy and colonialism and just all that stuff has been, um, it, it hasn't been easy, but it's been, it's been great, right? To see people move um, by having conversations um, and, and it's sort of exploring the roots of, of, of where the relationship um, lies with police. And, and, and yeah, just to add that this work is deeply relational, right? It's, it is deeply, it is about building lots and lots of relationships, even with people that we don't agree with all the time, but that um, in order to build something different and build an alternative in schools and in our communities, we are going to have to figure out how to engage with each other um, in a very different way. So, so we're dealing with that, um, but we are committed to using the power of our union, right, um, to to, def to continue to defund school police, to eventually abolish it, and to bring much needed resources to our, to our students and to our communities. Andrew, I know you already touched on your union successes and partial failures, but did you have any final thoughts? Um, the only thing I would say is, you know, I really want to emphasize also like kind of what Rosa said. It's like, you know, this is a long game. And, you know, at the end of the day, um, unfortunately, like, despite the massive successes that we've seen in terms of the uprisings, there's also hasn't been a ton of change. And the reality is, is that, unfortunately, the police are probably going to kill someone again. I mean, it's almost like, obviously, but also like the economy's not getting better. COVID's not getting better right now. Like the police are just going to be hand in, like, just like every, like just the situation's only going to get worse with police. And another like situation is going to happen. And I think the kinds of things that matter in those moments, it's like, by, if you can just start having those conversations now, those moments become so much more fruitful and productive when they happen. It's a tragedy, but we can take a tragedy and organize with it. But it's hard to organize if the thing you're, like in the middle of a crisis, you're trying to convince somebody about like the core and the, like the, the fundamental stuff. Like you wanna get that out of the way. And then when the, the, the rubber hits the road, you wanna start moving. Um, so yeah, I mean, like, like everybody's been saying, you don't have to be a full-time organizer, but you don't have to be a full-time organizer to just have a conversation, to show up at your GMMs and like push your leadership to have these uncomfortable conversations. Like, don't be a dick about it, but you know, just like, be, don't, don't let, don't, leadership is always going to be a little bit more cautious, a little bit more worried. And it's your job as like, as like stewards or members to be like, nah, like, I have faith in my fellow members to that we're mature enough adults that we could have a reasonable conversation about this stuff. So that that'd be my one of my things I would say that regular people who aren't ready to like go, you know, 24-7 into this stuff, like that's what that's what you can do. Thank you for that. And apologies to everyone listening. I'm going a little bit um, out of order because my screen changed. 
But next up, uh, we have Elizabeth, who's been a wealth of information uh, with all the statistics and also the critical political education that she's presented. And so Elizabeth, is there anything that you'd like to share as we wrap up? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, well, I, I think two things. Um, one is, you know, we talked a lot about why we need to get cops out of our community and out of our schools. Um, I just wanted to flag just, you know, for the educators on the call, um, it's very easy for anyone to be a cop. And so um, even if you're not, if, even if your job is not being a cop, you can still engage in cop behaviors. And so it's important for us when we think about like abolishing the cops to also um, abolish the cop inside your head. Um, you know, as an education civil rights attorney, we do see a lot of intakes from students and parents who report that um, their, their kids or the students themselves are being um, disproportionately disciplined um, when they're just expressing trauma or they're hungry at school um, or they're experiencing at-home abuse um, or they're actually just engaging in very age-appropriate behaviors um, that are somehow being seen as criminalized um, because uh, oftentimes because of their race and a very you know easy example I, I think you know this is mostly a higher education audience but a very quick example of this is there were um, four black girls um, in New York who were giggling in their school cafeteria and were um, seen as being high and they were strip searched um, and told that what they were doing is um, is that they were um, using drugs at school um, and they were just laughing with their friends in the cafeteria because that is a normal thing for um, students to do especially at their age um, and so just wanted to raise that point about not just abolishing the institution of policing but the, the philosophy of policing um, and then another thing I know that there's been some conversations in the chat around like trauma for teachers as well um, and how to um, you know, address that trauma. Um, and folks might be, you know, familiar with the concept of restorative justice or transformative justice. Um, and these are just non-punitive frameworks um, with roots in different um, indigenous cultures around the world. Um, I think Calvin mentioned this earlier. Um, you know, there are a lot of people of color who've been developing really um, effective ways of addressing harm that don't involve police. Um, and with restorative and transformative justice, which are a little bit different, but just a sort of a very high level summary of that is that this is the process that brings um, the victim and the wrongdoer together to acknowledge the harm that occurred, to center the victim's needs, and then to create a plan for the harm doer to repair that harm that they caused. Um, it's not, you know, supposed to be like a, a place to dispute the facts. Um, it's a place for the wrongdoer to admit that they did cause the harm and then to make amends and then to re-enter their shared community, which in a school space would be, you know, the school community. Um, and this has been more so um, implemented for non-sexual harm, but also um, works for sexual harm as well when you have somebody who is trained. Um, and so this is, this is not just like an alternative and that, you know, as long as you have this, you don't need to do anything else because you do need um, all the parties to come together and consent to the process. Um, but it is something that schools are using. A lot of institutions of higher education are including it into their um, student conduct policies. And it is a way um, for folks in a school community to address the harm that happened and to engage in some of these more systemic um, processes without resor um, resorting to um, unfair discipline, exclusionary discipline, um, and of course, to, to police. So I'll just say that. Thank you, especially for the education specific information. Uh, useful for us for sure. And so last but not least, we have our cops off campus reps. And again, I'll leave it up to you, Dylan, Ken, to decide who wants to go first and who wants to wrap everything up for us. I'm going to go first because I want Dylan to have the last word. But um, so I just I just want to uh, express my appreciation for this conversation. I mean, I think we all, you know, in different ways have acknowledged like how important these conversations are. And so I, I do feel like sharing uh, these kinds of spaces and this kind of information really helps build what we're trying to do and, and think about alternatives. I would just really quickly say there's a couple things as an educator. Um, I really am devoted to study and to thinking about the, that part of what we're doing is studying and learning and changing and that I, I actually have faith in the ability of study to change people and and to reaffirm that like as an educator feels important. Um, 
also, I think we should bring joy to these spaces. And I think that a lot of the activists who I've been really inspired by over the last few years are people who are really thinking about the kind of activist spaces that we create and how we don't just share, do, share Google Docs and have meetings, but that we actually think about ways that the work that we're doing in the world um, is the kind of shared space that we want to create, right? And that that is part of the work. And I think it's always important to emphasize that. Um, and I think that as an, again, as an educator, I think our default mode is to like go into like, okay, how do we problem solve and Google doc it? And anyway, you get it, some joy into the conversation. And then finally, um, I, th I don't think anyone's mentioned climate change in this conversation. And I feel like it's my, oh, it's also my ethical duty to uh, connect the dots and that we all recognize that part of what we're thinking about when we talk about uh, economic and political and social structures, when we talk about capitalism, we talk about the police, we're also talking about the, the um, ecological genocide that we're all um, participating in and that part of what we have to transform in the short term and the long term is our relationship to the planet. Um, so thank you all for, for this conversation. Uh, I, I wanna repeat what Ken said and say yes to study and yes to, uh, to fun and joy. Uh, we, we find that in the fight. I don't think that's somewhere else. I think that is in the fight. Um, and, and again, thank you all for inviting me part of the conversation. I'll just say a couple quick things to try to bring us to a point of departure here, which is in the first place, I wanna start with just as a point of emphasis, um, not more than a few years ago, or arguably a few months ago, it would have been almost unimaginable that the teaching, study, organizing, and activism that many of us had been engaged with as abolitionists for the last couple of decades would actually yield a shift in the problematic, um, that, that there would be a shift in the horizon of askable questions, and that that shift would tilt toward abolitionist questions. I mean, I see it manifesting in this conversation for the last couple hours, right? And, and, and again, I'm, I'm accustomed, I'm still not totally comfortable inhabiting that space. I'm used to being all the way in the somewhere else of the conversation and being that, right? And here, and here it's a different kind of place where we actually have a collective consideration and debate and conversation about abolitionist possibilities. We have to honor that. And, and, and my closing word is to say, do not sell that out. Right. Do not sell out the fact that we that we are in a horizon of abolitionist possibility right now. These are askable questions. These are these are these are makeable solutions. And again, that is following the black radical tradition. The last thing I'll also say, following the black radical tradition and following the abolitionist component of the black radical tradition, we have to carry with us and engage in collective discussions of mutual aid and self defense. I know I put it in the chat. I'm going to repeat it here these folks are coming for some of us in different kinds of ways. It's not just a stand back and stand by message. Um, I'm talking about this ongoing militarization of white civil society against particular targeted people and of the state against particular targeted people. Um, we, we, we don't have, I'm going to quote what, um, you know, a friend and colleague, a new friend and colleague of mine from Ujima Medics, mutual aid organization based in Chicago said, which is that um, for black folks, the state's not coming to help you and that, and that, and that we've only got ourselves. So I wanna follow that tradition within black radical mutual aid and, and say that if we learn from that tradition, then we are obligated, you know, to, 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 to kind of quote Ken here, an ethical obligation. It's an ethical obligation to start talking in more robust and mutual and dynamic ways about, about mutual aid and self-defense right now in whatever ways we can do it. Thank you all so much. Um, you know, on that note, I can't shut up. So I just, I need to add something. There were a, a, a few things that you all said. I think it started uh, with Elizabeth's discussion of transformative justice and restorative justice, and then as sort of moved along to Ken's discussion of ecological justice, and then and sort of settled with, with Dylan's discussion and reminder um, of us and the grounding of, of this movement and, and movements, you know, tangential to it in the Black radical tradition. And, and I just couldn't help but think as particularly Elizabeth was thinking about the sort of definition about transformative justice, bringing the victim and the harm doer together, and there being some sort of mediation and some sort of recognition of the actual harm that has been done. And I don't think that there is actually a way for us, there is not a way out 
of this problem for us until we can sit collectively together and recognize anti-blackness as a project of state colonialism and the fact that there needs to be some discussion of actual reparations. If we're thinking about transformative justice and restorative justice, then bringing the victim and the state together, the victims, the, the, uh, the generations of victims um, after you know those enslaved and the state and those corporate powers that have profited from that sort of collective um, growth of the state need to come together before any of this can really move forward. So how do we continue to push our people and continue to have conversations and direct folks towards this sort of foundational philosophical conception of anti-Blackness that goes hand in hand with the capitalist colonial project? I thank you guys so much for your time, for your energy, for your beautiful activism and sharing just like peaks of that with us. Uh, I hope to have more conversations like this in the future. Thank you, James, for bringing us all together. Um, you guys are amazing. And thank you for those of you who stuck with us till the end at home um, and those of you watching online. We'll see you all again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much for this. This is incredible. Thank you. Fuck the police. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. Be good to yourself. Fuck the police. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. I'm gonna stop recording. <laughs>